Thank you, Ricard. And yes, a huge thank you. I'm just going to, again, for the AV people, because that's a hard job. Um, Okay, so hi everyone, my name is Kat Gaines. I work at PagerDuty, that's me up there. We are talking about incident communications today. Um, just real quick, um, that is my QR code up there if you wanna connect with me on LinkedIn later, my Twitter handle, I'm going to admit I'm not on Twitter very often, so please just find me on LinkedIn instead. Uh, I work at PagerDuty, I've been there for about nine years. I used to run the technical support team there, and then a couple of years ago I switched to developer relations so I could come do this and talk to people <laughs> about incident management and all the things that we've learned over the years. So I'm gonna start with a story where I remember my mom texting me in October of 2021 about a Facebook outage complaining that she couldn't log into her Facebook page. This is pretty typical. Something goes wrong on the internet and she assumes that I can fix it because I work in tech. I don't work for Facebook <laughs> and even if I did, this was kind of a big deal. It wouldn't have been a one person fix. But I was kind of curious, I kept an eye on it. It was a pretty big issue and later I noticed they posted an explanation. When I was looking for it for this talk, I think I found it on their engineering blog and it was a pretty long explanation. We're not going to all read that together. Uh, but to most of us, we might read this and think, OK, yeah, generally kind of understand what's happening here. That must have been a hard day, a lot of hug ops to those folks. But my mom is not me. She is a little old German lady in her 70s. And I've worked for PagerDuty for nine years, and it took her maybe eight of those to really understand what I do. And I'm still not completely convinced that she gets it when she says that she understands what I do for work, but that's okay. She's happy, she's proud of me. So if she had seen this message, which thank God she didn't, it was just me, she wouldn't have known, of course, that there were things like status pages or engineering blogs, things like that to check. And even if she did, she really wouldn't get it. This would have been at least three hours of conversation between her and I explaining what they mean. So my point isn't to shame anyone. I'm not trying to shame Facebook, Meta, or anyone, but it's really just to highlight some opportunity. You have to speak the same language as your customers. You have to know who those customers are, and you have to cater your language to them, especially when you're writing a status page update. A lot of us don't have insight into how certain teams and brands decide to make their communications decisions in moments like this, but sometimes if there's someone advocating for customers and their understanding of the issue, they could stand to have a little more say in the final messaging itself. Plenty of us, if we work in tech, we work in software, we could understand this, and some of us still do use Facebook, but so do plenty of little old 70-year-old ladies. And again, point isn't to shame. We've all made mistakes like this. I've made communications mistakes in my time. I've known, I think everyone I know has. No one is perfect. And we'll keep doing it. We're imperfect. We will keep doing that periodically. But we can really learn something here, which is the importance of involving your customer-facing teams in those critical moments to make sure that we're translating correctly to ensure that your customers understand. So there's a massive, massive gap in how your customers perceive your product and how an engineer in your company, a product manager, anyone else in those sides of the business in your company will perceive it. For the purposes of this conversation, I'm setting aside the best practices that we all know that should enable everyone in your business to really understand your customers, to know the voice of the customer, your customer sentiment. You've probably heard those terms thrown around a lot by your customer-facing teams. But even if you're following those to the letter, this gap is huge and it exists because those groups will inevitably refer to exactly the same things in completely different ways. And it gets more complicated. For example, let's not even talk about what happens when we throw marketing in there. They come up with an entirely different language for it. So this is PagerDuty's chart of basic roles in incident response. We are focusing on the liaison roles in orange for the purposes of this conversation, but it's just good to remember where they sit in the process. So just a quick overview here. We have our incident commander who is running the incident call, making decisions, making sure things stay on track. You usually have a scribe who is recording what happened so that later you can go back and reflect on that. 
a deputy who can step in for either one of those roles depending on the need, or they can just be an assistant to the incident commander, making sure that things happen as planned, check up on tasks, those types of things. And then you also have your subject matter experts who understand intimately what's going on with the part of the product that's affected, and they're the ones who are hopefully working on fixing it. But your communications liaisons, you'll notice that I have two here. As far as who can fill these roles, your customer support teams actually have a really unique advantage here. They work with your customers every single day, all day, that's what they do, and they're best positioned to understand who those people are and what resonates with them. They've seen it all. They've made mistakes, they've course corrected and found the right ways to communicate with those customers. And every problem is unique, but especially the more seasoned of those team members will have found a pretty common language to speak to your customers and to get the message across. I'm going to pause for a quick sip of water. So before we dive deeper, we'll just overview how liaisons function in an incident. Your communications liaison, again, this is the overarching role that I'm talking about. It's the link to your customers and your stakeholders throughout the incident itself. It's really important for the rest of the command staff to be able to focus on the problem at hand instead of worrying about crafting messages to customers. You really can't do both of those things at the same time. So this role can sometimes be an all-in-one type role. I know in the last chart I had it broken into two, but for a lot of folks it can be just an all-in-one. But it can be broken into two, one for customers and one for your internal stakeholders, other employees who need clear messaging on what's going on, but who aren't involved in the incident itself. So we can look at how both of these work. Your customer liaison, they're the primary individual in charge of notifying your customers of current conditions. And they're also in charge of informing the incident commander of any relevant feedback they're hearing from customers while the incident progresses. That liaison should be doing a couple of things. Listening to the incident call. If you have a Slack room or another chat room where conversation is happening about the incident, they need to have an eagle eye on that and keep track of what's going on, understand how the incident is progressing. For example, is it still investigating or is it close to resolution? They should also be tracking incoming customer support requests. So they have to be in kind of a lot of places at once. They need to understand and report on the customer impact that the incident is having. So that's why it's really useful. We call it a customer liaison. We don't prescribe necessarily who has to be filling that role, but it can be really useful to have that person be part of a support team already. It's also worth noting that, again, these are the folks who are thoughtfully crafting messaging to your customers all the time. They understand their language. For example, you wouldn't want someone to report a full-scale outage to a customer during an incident if that's not what's happening. That could imply that, of course, something is very, very wrong, will stress your customers out further. And so instead, these folks are specially trained. They know how to tweak phrasing, say things like service disruption instead, to minimize concern and panic as much as possible. And then your internal liaison. So this person is in charge of notifying stakeholders of the current conditions. Anyone in the business who needs to know what's going on. That might be the rest of the support team, it might be a sales team, may just be other people in the company who are curious, executives who could otherwise jump in and distract from the incident resolution itself. And then they're also responsible, again, for coming back to the incident commander, letting them know of relevant feedback from those stakeholders in case there's something important or critical as the incident is progressing. So if you're using incident response software, it could be pager duty, it could be something else. This can often be automated a little bit. You can't always fully automate it, and if you can't do that at all, if you don't have the tools to do that, that's okay. The person in that role just needs to be someone who is really aware of the appropriate internal channels for disseminating those updates. In either role, the incident commander is always also excuse me, going to give that person feedback. They'll instruct them to create notification messages, to keep everyone in the loop updated at various points throughout the call, and then those liaisons will be required to craft the message, make sure they get approval from the incident commander before just going ahead and posting it. And then they want to, of course, disseminate that message to their customers or stakeholders last. So aside from just communication, customer support can also provide all kinds of actual support during an incident. 
We're talking about communication here, but it's important to know that these folks can provide a lot of value to your team. They can do things like aggregate the customer issues to give you a really clear view of how many people are reporting the issue, or even just a little bit of a view into what symptoms they're experiencing that you may not be aware of from just looking at the monitoring or what's happening. They can help you prioritize SLAs based on customer reports. Maybe there's a set of customers you could speed things up for optionally if you needed to. They can play double duty again as an internal liaison if needed. That is, I'm going to caution, having one person watch a lot of things at one time. But I've done it. It's possible. It's just not comfortable, especially as your company grows a little bit larger. And they can provide support with data in any post-incident follow-up actions. We'll talk about a couple of those things in more detail in following slides. Oh, yes. So getting into how we do this. It starts with just laying a foundation to make sure that you have the structure to make it happen. Your first step is making sure that your customer-facing teams just have enough info to do the job. A customer liaison should, of course, be involved in your incident response, but you also have to treat that team as a stakeholder yourself. Don't rely on an internal liaison to do it so that they are equipped. And when I say that, I'm talking about not just during an incident, but wholesale in terms of how you interact with them day to day. During an incident, those internal stakeholder communications can proactively provide some situational awareness, some transparency around the customer impact. And those updates should also be as proactive as possible so no one is caught off guard. That sounds a little bit wrong. Incident response is by its nature reactive, but as soon as you know that something is happening or you anticipate where it might go, you can fold that into those internal updates. And having a really well-defined internal communications process during your incident can really benefit your whole team. It can provide a more consistent understanding of the incident itself across the organization, Make sure there's some broad, real, in-time awareness of the impact of the incident. There's no one asking, well, how big is this? How affected are we? How many of our customers are experiencing this? And make sure, most importantly, I think that you have a really consistent incident narrative to share externally. You don't have different teams saying different things because they're getting guidance from their managers or someone else who may have a different idea of what's happening. So, this is some information you can include. Again, we're talking about the internal updates. You can include things like when the incident itself began, when did it start, just so that you know if someone says they're affected, if that actually falls in the right timing and scope. A brief description of any services impacted by the incident. You might be categorizing those as business or technical services, depending on how you organize your infrastructure, but you want to make sure that you clarify what those are and what they do. If you know any impact that the incident is having on customers. If you don't, again, that's OK. But if you have that information, include it up front. Where to find more information. So this is an important one. You do have to make sure that people know where to go. Again, if there's a chat channel, we use Slack channels at PagerDuty. If there's a call bridge that they should be joining, maybe there's a restriction on that, like only if they're a subject matter expert or someone else invited to the call. But make sure that everyone knows how to find that quickly so they don't have to go diving into a wiki to understand where it is. The location of any status pages that you might have. You might have internal status pages. Uh, we all probably have external status pages, but you may also have an internal one that people can just follow along with internally so they're not asking too many questions. Guidance on how to respond when customers ask you for more details. This falls into that consistent, consistent narrative piece. And then how often do you expect updates? We're going to talk about cadence a lot in a couple of slides, but this is kind of your first taste of that in this process. You're also going to want to consistently work with that team, again, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, outside of the incident response call. There are a few examples here of terms that you should be explaining to your support team. It's really best if you already have a close relationship with them, but if not, there's no time too late. Please start working on it now. Let them ask questions, even if those questions feel a little proby or, you know, why do you want to know that? You want to support building a relationship between their team and yours. If they're smart, they might ask questions about your tool stack, your infrastructure, terminology that they've seen floating around that they don't really understand. And again, please don't be standoffish. Let them ask. Help them. If they understand your world, they're better going to understand what is happening when that world is not functioning as expected. 
So there are a couple of things that you might want to share with them. Things like tools and systems that you have in use. These, again, are going to be common knowledge to other folks in your teams, but there's no way to guarantee definitely that all of your customers understand what chef configurations, nomad clusters, and Kubernetes mean. They might not. Things like internal tools that have been built, the naming conventions that come with them, those become a really silly language sometimes that is only spoken by people who work at your company. Likewise, code names for product launches or creative names for teams or working groups. These are really fun to make fun when we're naming these things, but you do still need to have a definition so that anyone coming in can understand what it actually means. Uh, the tools that deliver parts of your services, and then my favorite, freaking acronyms. So this is more secret code that is really only known by people at your company. And it's very easy to say, well, it's commonplace. Everybody knows what that means, right? This is the world we live in. But even if you think it's commonplace, I've got a good example up here. If you know, you know. But please don't make it so you have to know. That's a mouthful. Uh, so even if you have some process in place with these teams, but you haven't shared these details, again, it's really a better late than never strategy. Please go ahead and start now. So after you have that foundation set up, you want to make sure that that team has the tools they need just to get the job done when communicating. So first of all, in their toolkit, where do they get info? It's really crucial that they know where to get that info in a really scary moment for them. You want to have a channel of information established. So for example, at PagerDuty, there are multiple ways support can get information. There's the good old classic JIRA ticket. Uh, there's the PagerDuty app itself, which integrates into support tools like Zendesk and Salesforce Service Cloud, and I think a few more. Uh, and a Slack channel, where information is readily available when something is happening. So those tools and channels have to be figured out early for this to work. That's why I say figure it out now, because you're not going to want to do it in a critical moment or right after a really gnarly incident has happened and you're trying to figure out how to make it better next time. They also need to know the process. They have to know their role in incident response. So again, for many of us, that's going to fall into a customer liaison or communication role of some kind, but have some clearly defined roles and a description for them. This can be really hard to come up with from scratch, so this is where I'm going to lean a little bit on the fact that I work for a company that does exactly this and tell you that if you need inspiration, we have what we call operations guides that are just best practices of how to do these things published on our website. I'm happy to guide any of you to them later. It's a really nice template for just getting started. And before you decide to communicate an incident, it's really important to have an agreed upon set of criteria for when that incident is communicated. False alarms and short lift issues can really just sometimes kick off incident calls in ways that you wouldn't expect. So knowing when communication is appropriate versus not will help your customers avoid widespread panic again when it is something that's a false alarm or relatively transient. This can be tied to your definition of what an incident is or your severity levels. And again, if you need some help defining that, we are always here to help you out. And you might also consider the following criteria. Which products are affected? How badly is the usage of those products affected? How many customers are affected? How noticeable is the impact itself? And is the impact something your customer might want to have contingencies for? Do they need a fallback plan for your failure mode? That team, that support team or other customer-facing team that you're equipping with this process has to be ready to pay attention to those things. They have to be ready to pay attention to how things are progressing, to update their own team, and then to have a plan for those customer-facing updates. And speaking of that plan, I'm just going to toss this in here really quickly. Oh. Too fast. Uh, I cannot strongly enough recommend having some templates for incident communication. It sounds a little bit just like something we don't want to do at a knee-jerk level that, you know, we don't want to have canned language or sound too robotic about something. But we'll talk a little bit more about what these look like in a couple of minutes. It's really just your first line of defense to have something where you don't need that team to come up with language from scratch. There is a template there that they can follow. It can still be unique. They can still make sure that there's a human voice behind it. But they can really cover different stages of an incident, both for the standard issues and special situations. Again, we've got a little more on those in a couple slides. So now, after we've done those things, 
it's time to start thinking about how to break it down for your customers. The very last thing you want as maybe an incident commander or the subject matter expert or just someone else hanging out in the call is to be asked to draft communication yourself. I've seen incident calls where someone jumps in and says, well, can that engineer who's the SME for this, can they just draft the communication? And the response is, of course, no. They're trying to fix the issue. Could we let them do that instead? So start fresh. Make sure you have a customer liaison in the incident call listening to what's happening as close to the very beginning as possible once you realize it's customer impacting. And then when it's appropriate, they can draft their understanding of, an issue, of the issue and they can ask for a review. In that communication, they should be thinking about the customer perspective. If an internal system is being referred to, their first job is to identify what that maps to on the customer side. So to equip them to do this, I'd recommend that you have some kind of system map for them internally as well. You might already have one, and it could be too much of a deep dive for this purpose if it's something that you're using day to day. So you might want to work with support with their leadership or with someone else on their team to just have a quick, easy, maybe high level one for them that offers some quick translations into which parts of the system perform which functions for your end product and what's customer facing. And then for those communications, some things the liaison will want to keep in mind and that you can help them with when reviewing are to keep the terms as basic as possible. If there isn't clear terminology, pivot instead to describing just what's impacted in the product itself. What symptoms might a customer see? How will it break their experience? You might be able to, they might be able to get this from their peers, but make sure to train them that if they're not sure, they should always feel empowered to ask the incident commander to pipe up in the call and say, hey, I need help with this, at least in an appropriate moment, and get that feedback so they're drafting the right communication. We also want to, again, define terms. So back to our internal defining terms, this is the external side. We need to define those terms for clarity and communication. It can be as simple as if you say infrastructure and you actually mean a server, you can say so. And when you have the more vague term and you want to use the more specific term, you can either just put it in place of the vague word, or if you really need the vague word in there for some reason, just put the specific term in parentheses just to define that. And then quality over quantity, we want to keep it as short and sweet as possible. Just essential information only. Don't bog down the customer with a bunch of extraneous information that isn't going to actually help them. You also need to set expectations. So they need to understand, when are they going to hear an update again? When are they going to be able to see a little bit more around what's going on? If we don't have a lot of info yet, when are we going to have that for them? We'll talk in a moment about cadences and being able to realistically set those expectations. You also want to update with meaningful context. Again, a little bit more on that coming in a moment, but make sure it's always something they can actually act on, not just fluff. And then provide follow-up information. When all is said and done, how are they going to follow up? Where are they going to hear more? So we've done both of those things. And now, once the process is laid out, we can do the thing. We can communicate. I'm going to give you a really hot tip here. You don't have to have them do this for the first time ever during an incident itself. That is a really hard way to crash and burn right into the deep end. If you run game days, we call them failure Fridays at PagerDuty. You might call them incident simulations. I'm probably missing a couple. But if you do any of that already internally to prepare for your own incident response process, please include your customer-facing team and include the communications process as well for a dry run before the real thing ever happens. You can even set them up with a sandbox status page so that they can go in and know how to post on there and know what all the buttons look like so they don't have to face it for the first time in crisis. Practice really does make perfect. But then when it's time, your first communication, we're going out. It should in indicate that an incident is really under investigation. That's it. That's all you can really say, usually, in the first communication. The goal here is just to avoid your customer experiencing the symptoms of the incident, checking your status page, your Twitter account, somewhere else where they think they might see that that's something that's happening, and not seeing awareness of the issue from the business. You really don't want that look as often as possible if you can avoid it. 
there should be decision and posting of the initial communication within five minutes of kicking off the call. That might sound so fast. It sounds really fast to me still, even when I say it. It sounds a little scary. But again, you're not going to know a lot about what's going on. You're just going to know that something is broken. And that's enough to tell your customers that, yep, we're aware of it. We're looking at it. Again, your templates come in here. These messages can be totally templated for ease, ease of action. Something simple, this piece of the product is down, we are investigating what's happening, we will let you know more soon. That's all you have to be able to say. It can be very minimal in revealing scope. You're probably not going to know yet. But it should indicate that there is going to be scope coming soon, that you're not just going to leave them in the dark. And then your next communication. Again, kind of quick within five minutes of the first one, once you have some scope of impact that's known. That might feel like there's no way you'll know within 10 minutes, but actually, usually within 10 minutes, you've started looking into things. You have a little bit of, OK, here's what it definitely isn't, at least. And so you can outline anything you do know. Again, it might be minimal, but just tell them what you have. Things like customer impact, how many of your customers are affected. This might not go into the external message, but at least your internal teams can understand that. Any updates of which components or functionality are affected of the product, your customers should probably know that part. And then any regions which are affected, if applicable. And then depending on the length of the incident itself, you're going to want some periodic updates. Those are going to be necessary. We recommend at least every 20 minutes from the scoping update during the first two hours of an incident. After two hours, you might choose to update with reduced frequency if it looks like this thing is going to stick around for a while. You might shift to a long incident communication model, and we're going to go into that in a, in a slide just down the line here. But regardless of the expected frequency, when the degree of impact has meaningfully changed, that's when your updates should be posted. That actually, if anything, is the only rule, meaningful change. And so your cadence might change a little bit based on that. We have our recommendations, your best practices. But if you are posting too often and just giving them fluff, that's not helping. And if you're posting too little and they have no idea what's going on, that's not helping either. So when I talk about meaningful change, what I mean is those updates shouldn't indicate any changes to impact or scope of the incident itself. They should indicate if you think you might have shifted into recovery or mitigation steps. Even if you're not declaring full recovery, if you think you're on your way there, say that. If you're wrong, that's OK. Say that in the next update. But then provide an expectation of when the next update will be posted. Again, so they know what to expect. You also might have customers who have special contracts around their customer support or customer success. You might not even know if they have that or not, so go ahead and ask leaders of those teams. But they might have a contract for something that is often called a premium support plan, something like that, where they pay money to get faster responses from customer support. Those should probably receive some kind of different communication. The support or success team should help decide that. It might be an individual outreach. It might be through their account team. But just ask around. Find out what they have so that you're aware of what they're beholden to with those customers. And then those long-running incidents. So again, longer than two hours should be considered a long incident, should have some different communication procedures as a result. We're probably not going to update every 20 minutes for like six hours. But when we know that it will be extended, you have to set those customer expectations appropriately. And you also have to make sure that you're avoiding customer notification fatigue due to a content-less update. So when in doubt, just notify again at the frequency which keeps those meaningful. You also don't want to jump the gun. Please don't determine this within the first hour of an incident. Don't look at it, look at it and say, yep, that's going to take four hours. You might not actually know that. You could be right, but you could be very wrong. And you don't want to declare a long-running incident too fast. Again, so you don't panic your customers or even panic anyone internally. You just want to kind of let them breathe until you know for sure. If you do know it's a long-running recovery, though, say this as soon as possible in an update when you know. Don't keep them in the dark. And if you're planning to reduce the frequency of updates, which you probably should at that point, make sure you keep providing expectations of when the next update should be posted. And then resolution, our favorite part. <laughs> so your final communication should really be posted when full recovery has been confirmed only by the incident commander. They're the only person who has the authority to say, great, we're done, this is recovered. This update should include confirmation of full recovery 
Any clear indication of lasting impact, there might be data loss or lingering corruption that customers may want to just look out for in their accounts. But also, if there's no lingering impact, please clearly note that in the update. And then we are also going to get ready to create follow-up steps. We're going to close out the status page item. Again, your customer liaison is doing all of this. And most importantly, this is for your customer liaison, but also probably everybody in the call, breathe. <laughs> um, just get some rest. And I'm emphasizing this because you still see people a lot in hero mode where maybe there is one of those long-running incidents and that person just wants to stay on and be the person for you know, four hours at a time, and it's unsustainable. So remind yourself and everyone around you to take a breather when appropriate. It's nice to have maybe a rotation of folks who can switch out and be your backup so that you know that you're just not on the hook for communication or any other aspect of the incident for the entire thing if it's lasting a long time. So this has really covered how to start. Once you have these steps in place, you can go a little bit further in maturity. You can develop templates for your customer support team. Yes, you. You can help develop those templates in partnership with them so that when they write those status updates for customers, they know where they are. You can also recommend to them that those templates live in their ticketing system itself, as well as your status tool. It doesn't have to be confined to one or the other. Heck, throw one in a wiki. Publish it anywhere you want. Make sure that just they know where to look for it, especially for those common issues. And then do some regular hygiene check-ins, too. What's working and what isn't? This goes hand in hand with also having that customer-facing team participate in things like incident reviews or post-mortems. It's really important to communicate what worked and what didn't with customer communications as much as the technical details and the bones of the incident itself. So I mentioned game day practice. It's also a great time to check in on and update those processes for hygiene purposes. And then finally, get them in the incident review or post... Oh. Nope, not finally, but get them in the incident review or the post-mortem as well. Make sure that you talk about what worked and what didn't work about the communications. Maybe they can call out that there was executive swoop that was distracting them from writing an update. Maybe there was information they needed at a critical moment and it wasn't available. Maybe someone else in another team worked really well with them and deserves a shout out. And then, finally, consider formalizing the role at some point. Whether it's a percentage of a support engineer's role or a separate role under your org, or even just something like a formal on-call rotation, that percentage thing can be kind of hard to figure out. But again, bringing support into things like on-call rotations and just having a sense of incident rates can help you with that. You can get that data from tools that do that, like PagerDuty, but also other tools as well. This can even be an option for career development, something they can grow into, or a role from which they can grow into other roles. You'll have to be a little creative about this. I don't know if you know this, it's a well-kept secret. Support teams don't really get budget a lot of the time, but it's worth working with their leadership to figure out what's right for your org and what's possible for both teams, regardless of where the money or headcount sits. So thank you very much. Uh, again, my LinkedIn QR code is up there. I mentioned our operations guide for incident response. I don't have a QR code for that, but the link is there. And again, I'm happy to guide anybody to any of those guides later on if you want to come find me or message me. And uh, yeah, just thank you very much. Okay, yeah, we have, we have some questions. Great. They are more of your, your opinion, so maybe personal opinions are sometimes complicated. Well, the first one is, is one that I'm also curious about. They're asking, like, PagerDuty internally. You obviously, hopefully, use PagerDuty, but do you use a separate instance in case the main offering of PagerDuty goes down? Yes. If you can disclose these things, yeah. Yeah, no, um, I'm actually going to guide everyone to a weekend. Oh, oh, sorry. Oh. My mic isn't on. Espera, que el micro es el Liana para el micro. Yeah, we have a, it's at this point a really old blog post, but our head of operations at the time wrote it. It's called Who Watches the Watchmen? Yeah, yeah. It's on our blog. It goes to extreme, into extreme detail about it. It's still mostly accurate, so please go read that, um, because otherwise I'd just be reading the blog post out to you from the stage. Mm -hmm. 
So they're asking like, okay, apparently there was a massive outage in Cloudflare, and they did a live webinar with Q&A, kind of open. What's your opinion on, on being so open and exposed? Yeah. Is it like dangerous? Well, it's obviously, you know. On a personal level, I kind of love it. Um, you have enough comfort with your systems to have that transfer transparency with your customers. You're showing that you trust their customers, and in, in turn, you can they can trust you. I'm, my words are complete word salad right now. Um, <laughs> you trust them, they can trust you in turn. That's going to really depend on doing those types of things. If you can find that comfort, you still might obscure some details. Yeah, yeah. If you have that kind of thing, you probably have to have some extensive conversation ahead of time about what's appropriate not to say, build it into your incident response process if you're interested in doing yeah. something like that. And like, do you advise against or in favor of automating any, whenever there's an outage, right? Yeah. The first thing you do, you put some status page to you. Are you in favor of doing some automated thing? Absolutely. Before? Yeah, just, absolutely. just communicate, no? Yep, absolutely. Like, I'm in favor of that. PagerDuty as a business is in favor of that. You still have to have a human touch on it. Um, you can't completely, you know, wipe it out with AI or anything like that. But if you can automate part of the process to just make it easier on the humans doing it, please do so. There are a bunch of ways that, for example, you can automate some status page updates, like those quick templated ones that I was mentioning. Those types of things are great candidates. And the final one, like imagine the update, uh, sorry, the, the outage goes on, so there's no update. Like, yeah. what do you put on the status page? We're still working on it, like yeah. maybe. Probably yeah. some, some, you know, you probably have advanced in your investigation. So. Yeah. You still want to decide on, that's where that cadence switch comes in handy, so you're not doing that every 20 minutes, but maybe you can say, we're going to update every two or three hours. If you don't have a meaningful update, you still promise to tell them something, so you just say, I'm sorry, we don't have anything, we are still investigating, and maybe you consider extending your threshold a little bit longer if you don't think you're going to know something sooner, but just keep an eye on those thresholds and what's realistic to have information. All right, well, I think this covers most of them. So thank you very much, Kat, thank for you. coming to Barcelona all the yeah. way from San Francisco. Thank you thank so you. much. Oh, oh, this is mine.